Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters. So we're at Picking a Fur Coat on Williamson Street in Madison. Daniel, thanks for having us in today. Welcome. Welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about the restaurant. Well, um, just celebrated our eighth year. My business partner and I opened it up just to do good food and developing those flavors, my own unique flavors from my childhood and also what I learned through my traveling. As a young like, cook, like I worked in uh, Minneapolis, I worked in Chicago, Milwaukee, and then I moved to Italy and I studied in Italy. I think Italy really opened my eyes on what real Italian food is. Growing up in Italian American, I would see these red sauce joints, use these canned tomatoes, like we only get the stuff from Italy. The farm to table, that's what it was. They didn't call it farm to table, that's just the way they cook food. But when I was in Italy, I was like, we gotta do this in Wisconsin. I use all the Wisconsin products, but I use Italian techniques kind of the things I learned from all those places and keep it simple and just focus on the food. Yeah, so this is like our lardo that we here. We kind of do it in a traditional way from Colonata. They're famous for their marble. So the whole city is encased in marble. It's a beautiful city. It's just been curing for about nine months. So it used to be, you know, a softer piece of meat and now it's just hard like a, like a bacon, like a cured meat, like a pancetta almost. There's something too, like if you use extra virgin olive oil, because it has what, 0 0.04 oxygen and water in it. So it definitely encased that herbs and all that stuff in there too. It just becomes great. Both my parents were immigrated from Italy. They would cure meats, had a huge garden in their backyard, and that kind of, that's where the passion grew. You know, I have friends come over in junior high, high school, it's like, why does your basement smell? <laughs> oh, because we got a super sada curing in the other room and it kind of stinks. <laughs> I'm, I'm literally drooling thinking about all these things. Yeah. Is, is there any chance we could eat some stuff? Of course. Great. Yeah, we could do it. Awesome. A little bit of oil, not too much oil, because you're going to try to render off the fat. All right. And at this point, I'm going to add some collaborating chilies to it. Give it a toss. Not letting anything burn. Just let it warm up, let it release, let it get soft. And then at this point, then, I'm going to add my tomato sauce to it. And basically you just want to let the tomato and all the other ingredients just incorporate for about a couple minutes. Now I'm going to add my pasta. The key to making a really great pasta dish is cooking the pasta 90% there and then finish the rest of the way in the sauce. It's for it absorbs that flavor. Maybe a quarter cup of pasta water because it's seasoned, it's starchy, it's beautiful. So here you go. Boom all together. I'm going to take the fresh basil. I'm going to tear it. I'm not going to cut it. It's going to add aromatics. It's going to be freshness, almost a sweetness because basil is kind of sweet to the dish. Basil takes about 30 seconds and you're done. Boom. I like to put it on the middle, give it a little twist, put the sauce on top, and then you're going to finish it off with the Pecorino Romano. Right on top. Pecorino Romano is going to be salty sharp really balance out the dish voila all right so here's the bucatini a la montreal what is it uh it's a spaghetti with a hole in the middle right it means little hole spaghetti so, with a hole yep so man i smell like the richness of the tomato pork like there's a decent amount of pork in this uh, just the lardo okay yeah it's the fat that rendered out mm -hmm. and you just it's folded into the pasta so it smells amazing That is a good bowl of pasta. Thank you. Of course. Like, number one, the pasta is cooked perfectly. So it's just slightly al dente, which means that it has a little bit of like snap left to it. But then you get all these other flavors that kind of come in. Like that herbaceous tomato, the acid, the salt. That's really like that first hit that you get and it's really well balanced. But then you get the chilies that kind of like linger on your palate but it's cooled and, and kind of mellowed by the Pecorino Romano. It's one of those dishes that really works your whole palate. But the thing that I love about it is it's straight up comfort food. Because this is like a, a meal that I could eat 
every single day. Yeah. And it's super easy to prep. I remember eating this and go watching uh, Juventus games with my dad. Which is <laughs> simple. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, this is, this is completely delicious. Thank you. So there's another facet, obviously, to, to picking a fur coat, and that's that's the deli. And, yeah. I, and I have to say, like, you come from a family operation. Does that still extend here? Yes. So my dad runs a deli in Kenosha called Tenuta's Liquor and Deli. At a very young age, my brother and I and my sister would work there. So they just kept on getting Italian products and just educating the community. I mean, that, that's the food that shaped me. As a little kid, you know, you go to school and I had a prosciutto sandwich and everybody else had Lunchables or something. There's a bunch of different types of prosciutto and I knew that as a kid. I'm like, why don't we get San Danielle? Why don't we get Parma prosciutto? Like, how do you know these? I'm like, this is my family stuff. So that's kind of like my snootiness when it comes to cured meats. Yeah, there's definitely more and more products I see that are just, I forget they're there and you can't get in Madison. I just wanted to get what my dad and his family did in Madison. So about two years ago, my business partner and I and my brother opened up an elementary by a pig in a fur coat, which is like a stone throw away from here. Offer five different types of prosciuttos, more cured meats, some Italian, French, Spanish cheeses in there. Well, like we get, you know, the Pecorino Romanos, we got the, the brown cow, Parmesan Reggiano, and then we also make fresh pastas. Okay. And then also get some really good products that I use here, like olive oils, vinegars, uh, salts. Because people always ask me all the time, like, where do you get this stuff? Sure. So I just did it. Yeah. I just opened this deli. I have my restaurant to uh, cook for you. And I'm just trying to like curate something that you can cook for yourself. And here's the products. We're going to be cheaper, super high quality, and also slice fresh. No preservatives to keep it fresh on the shelf. And plus on my break, I just go walk over there Slice and prosciutto and come back. <laughs> it's great. That, that, so. that sounds uh, pretty much perfect. So talk to us a little bit about the menu that you run here. So we use a lot of diverse things. Mm -hmm. Like we have raviolo filled with a ch uh, duck egg and ricotta, octopus dish, slowly cooked octopus with crispy pig's head with nice. the mole sauce, fried potatoes, super good. What about the, the foie? Like, oh man, yeah. Cause, cause, I mean, to, to be fair, like foie is one of those ingredients for a lot of chefs. It's, it's, it can be polarizing, right? Yeah. And for diners, like, oh, foie, I don't, I don't. Well, tell it's, me about your philosophy with foie. Um, it's where you get it from and who's producing it and the love they have behind it. So I use Ambon Canard and he does about 3,000 ducks a year, which is amazing. It's small, totally. small farmer but it is some of the best foie gras in the world because mm -hmm. he's doing amazing stuff. That's crazy. So what do you do with it? Man, so like, there's a couple different things we use. Uh, we make foie gras mousse. I definitely had customers in here buy like six of those dishes when they're eating here. They, they just love it. Yeah. They'll get it in the beginning, get it again, and then get it for dessert. <laughs> so I do this bumbolini, Yeah. and it's a mini donut. Yep. And I wanted to put the foie gras inside of it. It was really hard because it was a hot donut, so it just melts. So what I did instead was I took the, the sugar out and we use a lot of malt and honey. So it's a little more savory. I took the donut, I wrapped it in lardo, mm -hmm. served it with a fig port jam, which we make here, and made a foie gras mousse disc with grappa on top. It hits your salty, sweet, savory, rich. And then a 13-year-old balsamic, just a garnished plate. And that's it. Here we have our foie gras mousse. I think the question when I see a dish like this is, do you want me to eat this all in one bite? Cut in half and try to get everything I want bite. Okay. Here we go. Get it all in. Get the jam. There you go. Yeah. Wait for it. There it is right there. Mm-hmm. Damn. You could talk about that bite like all day. Yeah. So when I first taste it, you get like that luxurious buttery mouthfeel. But the thing that I think is really interesting is there's a bitter note in that fig, a little bit, yep. that really combines well with the malt. Yep. The consistency, you get like a little bit of bounce in that uh, bomboloni. But it's, it's so counterbalanced with the lardo, and then the the soft and suppleness of that that foie gras. Even as we go now, 
as I'm breathing more, and we're like, what, a minute out? Something like that? I've been pontificating about that first bite. I get like umami kind of pulling me back in from that foie, like that earthiness, that richness, that really beckons for that second bite. Yeah. Really good cooking. It's like putting on an opera, putting on a show. You have a lot of preparation for one dish. You know, making the foie gras mousse takes a couple days. Uh, make bombolini, you can't make that on the fly. And the simple things take the longest, right? That is nine months in the making. And that's what the beautiful part about it is. That's fantastic. Dude. Thank you. Of course. Cheers. Mm, that's my pleasure. So I'd love to see like a little bit more behind the scenes of where you're from and the food culture that, that basically puts dishes together like this. And I'm wondering like, if we went to Kenosha sometime, you think you'd walk me through Tenuta's? Yeah, let's go. Awesome. When my dad, it was 1965, I think, when they moved here. I think there was a handful of delis back then, like in Wisconsin, especially Chicago, that were been around. They try to recreate what they had in Italy. And so there's a lot of mini deli stores on every block. And then over time, you know, generations didn't want to do that. Tenuta's really stuck there and kept it growing. Honestly, I met people around the world that knew this store. So it's kind of amazing. It's just a lot of Kenosha tradition, so a lot of Italian, but also sprinkled in here is other heritage from like, you know, Greece, Polish, German food. There's a little things here and there that, you know, if you would ask my father, could you get that in, he would get it for you. A lot of residents here in Kenosha, they were from my own town. So when I start working here, everybody's requesting a lot of pasta, olive oil, tomatoes, you know, fresh mozzarella. I even brought in buffalo mozzarella when it was not available here in the state. You know, you get the real Samarciano tomato, which is from Naples. How many different vendors did you work with? I had almost close to 200. 200 different vendors? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. At one point. Yeah. That's, a, that's a lot to keep, yeah. you know, to keep track of. So, uh, and then I fall in love because I love food. I like to eat it, so I try most everything. <laughs> Anything is here, I probably try it. It's hard not to. Yeah. It's hard not to snack here. Yeah. It's like your ultimate charcuterie board. <laughs> they had these connections throughout all over from California, New York, and they just buy in bulk and they just have amazing stuff. I think having a store like this, is, you know, a small business, is very important because it's just the customer relation. If you can't find something, maybe something you had in a different country, they would find it for you. And it's just that personal care. I mean, there's been employees here that have been working here for 20 plus years. There's a handful of them, and so you can't get that. These box stores, they don't have that dedication. So we're just trying to be how it started. My grandfather started it, it was small, and it was kind of built on what the customers wanted. If they asked for something, you tried to take care of them, or maybe you got a deal on something, and, and that, that's what you did. We're landlocked, so we probably are overcrowded. We are probably have more stuff in here than we than we can fit, um, but that has always been a way we, we've been. Some people say you should build a new store, but it, it just wouldn't be the same, I think. It, you know, it'd just be another store. I think the smell, and you know, you get some, some young kids come in, they're plugging their nose, and we laugh at it, and then some people think it's the greatest smell in the world, so. So yeah, it's a very unique smell, the store. Here you would smell like the meats, the cheeses, the herbs, all that stuff, the oils. It just you know, people would always want to bottle that up, they said, and sell it. I'm not sure how to recreate that smell, but it was always on my clothes growing up. So coming down the aisles here, um, we have olive oils for days, vinegars. Uh, one of my favorite products are some of these canned tomatoes. You know, um, the Posada ones are awesome for like quick tomato sauces at home. A lot of DOP, um, San Marzano tomatoes, like this one right here, very famous one. La Bella brand. What else? Like all oh, man, all these canned tomatoes, amazing from all different parts of Italy too. This mostly south, but you have a lot of vinegars, and then you have like balsamic. The real balsamic vinegars are on top shelf, hard to reach. Really great stuff. This is the pasta aisle, where they have like their own brand dry pastas, and then we get into like the the DiCecco brands, um, and then we're gonna get to the more the high quality stuff. You know, some of the stuff that I actually brought in to the deli, to Madison. 
There's just so many different cuts of pasta. So everyone just grabs like the penne pasta, the spaghetti. I love the pakari pasta. It's like a really thick rigatoni. As you can see, like it's almost like a three inch by one inch diameter. It's amazing cut. So that's one of my favorite ones. So like there's a big difference in pastas. You get these brands, like the Puro brands. They use like a brass dye. They take about three days to cure. So you have great texture to it. The cook time on it is much longer and it's hard to overcook it because it's a much better product. This is my favorite cut of pasta right here. It just takes about 18 minutes to cook. It has a great bite. It absorbs a lot. It's just fun to eat. I believe they, you can tell they hand rolled each noodle. It's fantastic. It's out of this world. This is unbelievable. Hey, Luke. How's it going, man? Good, good. how are you? Great. Are you enjoying your time? I am. This is actually my first time in Kenosha ever. Oh. So this feels like uh, I get kind of a behind the scenes tour and uh, get to learn a little bit more about the people that are here, but also the cultural traditions that, yeah. that are in the city. Well, glad uh, to host you, so. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, what's good here? What do you Ooh, do? Every time I'm back, I always get the mufalado. Okay. Some prosciutto. Yeah. And maybe some string cheese. I don't, that's a childhood thing. <laughs> What kind of prosciutto? I mean, there's so many varieties, uh, right? My favorite is San Daniel. Okay. So. That actually sounds like a go for me. Is that cool? Yeah. Awesome. Great. Thank cool. you. Are you going to eat? Yeah, let's eat. Great. Oh, we're going to eat the big one. Big one? Yeah, perfect. There's nothing subtle about two men sharing a sandwich that's nothing short of massive. Agreed. All right, you ready for this? I think so. All right, here you guys go. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you, thank you. That is a monster. Uh, so I just take? Yeah, take it, we'll, we'll, we'll go sit outside and eat it. Yeah, all right, we'll so, work on this. Thanks guys. This eats like a job, this yeah. is nuts. Cool. Cheers. Let's talk about the prosciutto first. So this, uh, one of the things that I love to do with prosciutto is hold it up to the light. Yeah. And what, what, what are we looking for? There's a couple of different things. You know, you want it thin, you want to make sure you get a little bit of the fat and the meat on there. But usually traditional how you want to eat prosciutto is kind of tear it up and eat it because you want some of the fat and the meat together. Mm -hmm. So you don't really eat the whole slice in one bite. Right. So that's a lot of meat. <laughs> Thin to win though. Yeah, that's, exactly. Yeah. That's always like the MO with prosciutto. Yes. And this is about any charcuterie, right? Pretty much, yeah. You, it's The thinner it is, the more it's going to melt in your mouth and it's going to be... Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to gnaw on it for a while. Awesome. So, so I'm going to have you uh, do my job. Let's, let's both take a piece of prosciutto. All right. And uh, I'm going to have you tell me what you taste when you eat prosciutto. There you go. Yeah. Mm. So what do you taste for the viewers at home? Mm. Well, I'm getting like, um, you know, like obviously salt because it's aged 24 months. Should be a little nutty flavor, sweetness from the meat. I get some floral notes. Uh, with San Daniel, it's going to be more of a sweeter pink prosciutto. Mm -hmm. where Parma is going to be a little more saltier. Th that is, I think, one of the sweetest prosciutto's I've ever had. Yeah. It, and it lingers yes. uh, with the nuttiness. Yeah. It's amazing. So if the muffalata. Yes. I want, I want to take a piece of this just to be able to illustrate it here. So what you got here is you, know, you obviously got your bread, your lettuce. Yeah, provolone, pepperoni, capicola, ham. You got some mortadella and general salami with marinated peppers and Italian vinaigrette. <laughs> it's a lot. So they come in a couple different sizes, but we got the biggest one, because why not? Because why not? When, yeah. in, when in Kenosha. Let's dig in. All right. Is there a specific way you eat it? I don't, just don't make a mess. Okay, don't make a mess. Cheers. Usually with your mouth. Yeah. Mm. That's ridiculously good. It's refreshing. Right? It doesn't feel like a lot. Like this thing looks huge. The, but bread, the bread's light. Yeah. That lettuce is really refreshing and crisp. The provolone is really creamy. And that combination of Italian meat, it's amazing. Peppers, onions, delicious. This is the best sandwich I've had in a long time. How many of these do you think you can take down? In my heyday, probably half of it. Now, maybe one. You can do, you can do four in your heyday? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the gauntlet's been thrown. I just wanted a longer break back in the day. <laughs> I'm still eating that. I can't come back to work. <laughs> he took down a whole muffalata. <laughs> oh, he's paging you on the yeah. overhead. I'm so on break. If you know anything about good food and the construction of good food, 
you could literally grab like any 10 elements off of those shelves and put together something that like would equate a masterpiece in most people's, you know, culinary repertoire. Yeah. I've always brought like other chefs with me to come visit Tenuta's and it's just the expression on their face is like, how did I get this far without knowing of this place? And it kind of just makes me, you know, just happy and proud of the family and my upbringing. Sure. You know, try to keep the tradition alive. Yeah. And try to still introduce people to Tenuta's and to this type of food. Yeah. It's amazing. Thanks yeah. for bringing me here. Oh, thanks for coming. Of course. So. I feel like this is one of the untold secrets of Wisconsin culinary. These pockets of independent grocers and delis and people holding on to cultural traditions really make dining exciting. But this is the essence of our culinary tradition. This is the essence of a lifetime of work. This is the essence of Wisconsin. I think it's important to find your local grocery store, a small place, and just encourage them to do more stuff and stand behind them. Can I start a second piece of muffaletta? No. Okay. <laughs> no! <laughs> My parents, uh, they're super proud of me. So when, the, when Ed comes here, he just eats the whole menu for some reason, <laughs> and it never works out. I put them to work nice and early. I try to keep them out of trouble. And uh, I tried. Sure. <laughs> so. Wisconsin Foodie would like to thank the following underwriters. The dairy farmers of Wisconsin are proud to underwrite Wisconsin Foodie and remind you that in Wisconsin, we dream in cheese. Just look for our badge. It's on everything we make. At Organic Valley, our cows make milk with just a few simple ingredients. Sun, soil, rain, and grass. And grass. And grass. Yeehaw! Organic Valley grass milk. Organic milk from 100% grass-fed cows. Employee-owned Nugler's Brewing Company has been brewing and bottling beer for their friends, only in Wisconsin, since 1993. Just a short drive from Madison, come visit Swiss Wisconsin and see where your beer is made. Wisconsin's great outdoors has something for everyone. Come for the adventure, stay for the memories. Go wild in Wisconsin. To build your adventure, visit dnr.wi.gov. From production to processing, right down to our plates, there are over 15,000 employers in Wisconsin with career opportunities to fulfill your dreams and feed the world. Hungry for more? Shape your career with these companies and others at fabwisconsin.com. With additional support coming from The Conscious Carnivore, from local animal sourcing to on-site, high-quality butchering and packaging, The Conscious Carnivore can ensure organically raised, grass-fed, and healthy meats through its small group of local farmers. The Conscious Carnivore. Know your farmer. Love your butcher. Additional support coming from the Barocco Food Co-op, Central Wisconsin Craft Collective, Something Special from Wisconsin, Crossroads Collective, the La Crosse Distilling Company, as well as the Friends of PBS Wisconsin.